Welcome to the Wagging Tails podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Noble Canine. Canine behavioural specialists and dog trainers. We provide global online consultations and training, as well as physical training and behavioural rehabilitation within Singapore. Welcome to the Wagging Tails podcast, where we dive into the important topics related to our canine companions. In today's episode, we'll be discussing a crucial issue that many dog owners face, dog aggression. It's something that many people are dealing with. And whether you have a reactive dog or you're somebody that encounters a reactive dog, it's important that we know what's best to keep not just ourselves safe, but our dogs as well. Because this is such a big topic, what we're going to be doing is splitting this into two podcast episodes. That way we're going to be able to have a deeper look into aggression and reactivity and give more information and advice to those that need it the most. So dog aggression can be incredibly concerning, but it's also a very complex behavior. So what we're going to be looking at in this episode is the different types of aggression, the potential causes, practical steps you can take to manage and address this behavior. In the next episode where we're addressing dog aggression and reactivity, which is going to be released on the 15th of September, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into the different types of aggression and how these would be tackled to rehabilitate and help the dog become more confident and socialised, thus mitigating and eventually eliminating the aggression completely. So without further ado, we're going to jump into this. So Fraser and myself, um, we are canine behaviourists and we've had the privilege of helping countless dog owners address and manage a lot of these uh, aggression issues. So our approach focuses on positive reinforcement training and building a strong bond between our dogs and their owners. So to start off, we'll start with the most common one that is very easily misunderstood, which is fear aggression. So dogs react aggressively when they feel threatened or fearful in certain situations. This can be triggered by unfamiliar people, places, or experience. Overall, just a lack of familiarity to, to a lot of these things. Fear aggression can be seen as a fear of losing a particular resource, which translates into resource guarding as well. But the one thing that I, I want everyone to understand is that fear aggression, um, most forms of aggression, if not all, stems from fear. So with that said, whether we're looking at any of these different types, it's easy to connect fear to that. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But um, so with regards to fear aggression, what we're really looking at here is how our dogs perceive the environment around them. So dogs don't think quite as rationally as we do. And that doesn't mean that they're not massively intelligent animals, but they don't think about things as deeply as we do. They don't rationalize what's going on around them. They tend to think more along the lines of, is something dangerous or is something safe? And that's kind of where it draws the line there. So whereas we might be walking along the street and see an old lady carrying shopping bags or pulling along a shopping trolley, and we think it's just an old lady, there's nothing dangerous about that. If the dog has not been socialised to be around different items and novelty and people, or if they've had a situation where that could actually have triggered a fear of a trolley or something along those lines, your dog's not going to think along those lines either. Your dog's going to be thinking, that is a potential threat and I need to address that. The thing is... If your dog is on a leash, they cannot run away. So that leaves them with the option to fight because they cannot flight. So that's one of the big reasons that fear aggression starts to appear. So the next one is territorial aggression. Uh, dogs may become aggressive when they perceive that their safe space or their territory their home is being invaded. That's why a lot of dogs bark when someone's at the door. Um, they get a bit defensive. They start to 
tense up their bodies. It could be anywhere. It could be just like their bed. Uh, it could be the home. It could be even in your front yard. But one thing that we always advise our clients is to ensure that nobody enters your dog's safe space. So if you shape a particular couch, a particular dog bed, or a particular area in your home as your dog's safe space, a place where they go to to decompress, to unwind, to relax, no one is supposed to, what's the word I'm looking for? Invade. Uh, intrude. Yeah, in, intrude or invade on that area for your dog. So just on territorial aggression, it's important to understand again that we don't get to decide what our dogs see as their territory. So, for example, for a while, Porthos took my office as part of his territory. So it meant that when one of the other dogs would come in, he would have a wee growl. Now, that's as far as it went. And, of course, I managed to reshape that so that he understood that it was, in fact, for everybody. But I didn't choose that to happen. Porthos decided that by himself. So what I've noticed a lot with clients is, especially for people living in an estate area or in a condominium, a lot of the time, the immediate surrounding area the dog might see as part of their territory. And as a result, they become a lot more reactive in that zone. So you can have a dog that potentially outside in a different park in a more neutral area is absolutely fantastic around other dogs, for example. But the moment that dog is within the condominium that they are living in or the yard of that house or in the immediate area around the estate, that dog can then become very reactive and quite aggressive towards other dogs. So territorial aggression is not necessarily just a dog's bed or a room that the dog has chosen to be more possessive over or a home or a hallway. It can project out depending on the dog and what they've decided, which is why it's so important that we try to understand that when we're addressing this. And of course, when Jay's talking about safe spaces, that's a massively impactful method of helping dogs with this. And we will look at that in detail on the next podcast, but um, it's a very important aspect for territorial aggression. Especially so, if you have a multi-dog home as well. Each of your dog needs a safe space. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll look into that more Yeah, next the next week. episode. Yeah. So then we move on to resource guarding. Now, resource guarding is arguably one of the most natural reactions in the world. So we all resource guard. So for those of you listening, just put yourself into this scenario. If you're sitting in a cafe or a restaurant and I was to walk over to your table and reach onto your plate to pick up some fries... Are you just going to accept that? Joey doesn't share food. Joey doesn't share food. (laughs) So (laughs) that's a very good example because I guarantee that most people would turn around and be like, "Um, what are you doing? And they would react. And a lot of people would get quite aggressive about that. So why is it that we point to our dogs and say, oh, that's not right. You should be okay with another dog coming to try and take your food. You should be okay with another dog coming and taking a drink out of your water bowl. I'll tell you right now, if we're in a bar and somebody goes to pick up my beer, I'm definitely going to say something. That's resource guarding. So we've got to appreciate how normal resource guarding actually is. And a lot of people assume that their dog should just accept something that they themselves wouldn't accept. So... Effectively, what's happening here is, again, it's a fear of losing a resource. Now, that resource could be a piece of food, toys, or a resting area, a safe space. So you'll see that even resource guarding kind of crosses over and overlaps a little bit with territorial. But on top of that with resource guarding, you can also get this with people, as in the dog will be possessive over a person. 
And this is where a lot of people get confused and they talk about the dog being protective. But more often than not, the dog is actually being possessive and they're actually resource guarding the person. So when a dog gets jealous, they're not actually getting jealous. They don't experience jealousy in the same way that we do. For us, we might say, oh, my neighbor's got the new iPhone. That's a really awesome thing. I wish I had the new iPhone. I wonder if they'll let me look at it. Maybe I should try and save up and get the new iPhone. But the dog's brain is thinking more along the lines of, oh, my neighbor's got the new iPhone. I want a new iPhone. I'm going to take that iPhone. <laughs> so it's a lot more direct. <clears throat> so when we appreciate that, it's much easier to actually avoid it. It's much easier to then address it when we get to that point. We have rational thinking. So like, like Frazier said earlier, we will, if we really want that new iPhone, we'll, we'll think of ways to get it and save up money, uh, maybe our neighbor will let us uh, experience using it for a short while and then we can make our decisions from there. But dogs don't have that. They see something, they want something, they're just going to take it. So that, that's where training comes in handy. And one more important thing about resource guarding is that we don't get to decide what's a resource to our dog, what's, what is valuable to our dogs. Like your dirty old sock. I've had some clients who say that uh, their dogs take their socks and then when they try to take away the sock, the dog starts growling, but that's resource guarding as well. If they perceive it as a valuable item, object, or whatever, it's not in our place to tell him that, you know what, it's not valuable. This is for them to decide. That's a very good we... point, actually, because <laughs> one thing I've come across with a number of different clients is that they'll respect the dog appropriately if the dog is resource guarding, say, a bone. But if the dog steals, like, a hair tie or a tiny bit of paper, like rubbish, trash, yeah. then they'll just try and take it off of the dog because to the human, that's not a high resource. But we don't get to decide that for the dog. So we've got to be aware of that when we're dealing with uh, resource guarding. And we'll talk about that more in the next episode. But for like, this is a public service announcement. Don't be one of those dumbasses who like, oh, my dog has food aggression. I'm going to put my hand in the food bowl just to make him comfortable with it. No, that, that's how you promote that sort yeah. of resource guarding, actually. Absolutely. I mean, I often say to people when, especially if they've got young dogs, if they've got puppies or adolescents, and they say, oh, should I be putting my hand in the food bowl to stop the resource guarding developing? And I kind of think to myself, and not a lot of the time I'll say to them is that, that's how you actually create resource guarding because you're showing the dog that you may take their food. So again, we'll go into a lot more detail on resource guarding and uh, how to deal with that next time, but it's important to understand the do's and don'ts for that. And the best way to manage resource guarding is just to give your dogs a wide berth. And if they take something that's potentially dangerous, what you've got to do then is at the early stages, when you're just doing management, you'll need to trade that out with something of higher value. Now, a lot of people get annoyed when you say this, but we're talking about the very early stages before you start working on helping them. You can't allow your dog to steal a bar of dark chocolate and just let them have it. At the same time, you can't grab it off of them because then you're risking a bite. So trading at the early stages is by far the most appropriate way of keeping your dog safe. And then as we move on and do more exercises and actual solutions, we then, then take a big step away from trading because obviously that's not something we want to do long term. So the next form of aggression is dog to dog aggression. Aggression towards other dogs can occur due to um, social hierarchies, past experiences, or more commonly, a lack of proper socialization. It's also important to note that there's a very big difference between dog aggression and just being socially awkward. Mm -hmm. Some dogs, they don't know how to play, especially in, in most puppies that I've seen. They get so overexcited when they see another dog. They start jumping, they start lunging, they start barking. That's essentially 
just being socially awkward because they're excited for it. They want to play, but they don't know how to properly socialize. It's imagine if I just met you for the first time, I ran up to you and I started shouting, hi, hi, hi. And I just picked you up or hugged you and things like that. So it's, it's very awkward for, for the other dog as well. A, a well-socialized dog would know how to react accordingly and maybe teach the puppy like, oh, I'm not going to play with you. I'm just going to ignore you if you're so overexcited. That would be the best case scenario, but that's not always available to everyone. An important that's why Noble to... Canine. But... <laughs> that's why Noble Canine, we have five dogs who can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an important part to notice on that as well is that when you're dealing with social awkwardness and an under-socialized dog, when they're a puppy, there's something called a puppy license where most, not all, but most adult dogs will let the puppy get away with a lot more than they'd ever let an adolescent or adult dog get away with. And a lot of people that have dogs get fooled into thinking that their dog is okay because they're getting let away with that awkwardness when they go up to dogs. But when that, when your puppy becomes an adolescent and becomes an adult, if you've not properly socialised your dog and they run up, like Jay says, running up and shouting and screaming and hugging and picking up, dog form where they just run straight up face to face and start getting overexcited, even a calm dog will potentially defend themselves in that situation. So that brings us back nicely to dog to dog aggression. Because dog-to-dog aggression is not always an aggressor, an aggressor. Sometimes it can be a defensive. So a lot of people would say, oh, the dog that snapped is the one that's in the wrong. But again, if I was to run up to you and just grab you, even if I'm excited, even if I've got nothing but love in my heart, it's still inappropriate and most people will defend themselves because they'll feel a little bit intimidated by that. So dog-to-dog aggression can come as defensive. And the biggest problem with that is that when you've got a dog who feels that they have to defend themselves, it can then develop an aggressor in dog-to-dog aggression because they then feel that they need to defend themselves from all dogs. Now, that doesn't always happen. Don't get me wrong, but there, there is a... But there is a potential for that and we've got to be aware of that um with that i just want to point out as well here when we talk about social hierarchies generally the only time you see dog to dog digression within a social hierarchy setting is in a multi-dog household or if there's a group of dogs that spend a lot of time together this is not to be confused with alpha dominance pack mentality that has been disproven at length. I'm not even going to get into it. If you're interested to know what I'm talking about, you can have a Google search of it, or you can ask us in one of our live sessions or just send us an email and we'll be happy to get back to you on that one. But you kind of have to let dogs sort out their own social hierarchy within reason. Safely. This is where it's super important to read your dog's body language. Because if it looks like it's about to get too serious, it's our responsibility as the homo sapiens, it's our responsibility as our dog's leaders and guardians to keep them safe. And we must intervene if it looks like it's going to get too far. So this is a very important aspect to consider. And when you're separating situations like that, the best way of doing it is to have your dog well-trained in disengagement so that you're not needing to get involved. And again, that's something that we will look into. But I just wanted to highlight, when we sit, talk about social hierarchies, what we actually mean. Yeah, Blue and Ori have gotten into fights at the start when I just got them. It, it did take quite a long time to undergo training to do behavior modification and to overall just build that bond and that trust between each of them individually before I did training for them to be more comfortable with each other 
I wanted them to put their trust in me first. Ori has to trust me. Blue has to trust me. And then I started to allow them to, you know, solve their little disputes themselves because I know that they wouldn't take it too far as long as I'm around. So there was a good like three months where if I had to leave the house, uh, they, they would be separated. But then it's now come to a point whereby I'll be out maybe at work or something and I open my uh, doggy camera at home and I just see them playing on the sofa. Yeah. So a lot of that's the bonding and the appropriate socialization because a lot of dog-to-dog aggression comes from poor socialization or negative past experiences. So a dog that was maybe attacked by a dog as a puppy, they're more likely to have dog-to-dog aggression. Yeah. And that's something that we need to be very aware of when we're dealing with that. So what we'll move on to now is redirected aggression. This one's a very interesting one because a lot of people just assume that the dog is being aggressive towards them. But actually, redirected aggression comes when they cannot get to the trigger that they're aiming for. And what ends up happening <clears throat> and what ends up happening is that they actually become incredibly frustrated and they will turn on the person or the dog or the animal which is closest to them. And that's when you see people getting nipped on the leg and nipped in the hands by their own dogs because their dog is being triggered by something at a distance and they can't actually get to that. So this is where it comes very, very important to make sure that you are handling your dog appropriately and you know what you're doing. That's all part of management, which we're about to go into as well. So I want to talk a little bit more about the causes of dog aggression. One of the biggest topics that um, we discuss a lot is social learning, which we talked about in uh, episode six of our podcast. But let me just dive a little bit into it. So social learning refers to the process of which dogs observe, learn, or even imitate behaviors of other dogs or humans. It goes beyond just their instinctual behaviors and involves a lot of the cognitive processes that allow dogs to acquire or capture new information through observation and interaction. Because there's innate behaviors that they have of or things that you might consider trial and error learning. But social learning often involves watching and replicating actions or behaviors exhibited by the other animals around them or human companions. That's why you might have seen videos whereby a kitten grows up in a house full of dogs and it starts to act like a dog, it's it, or vice versa, which is really cute. (laughs) So social learning is a fundamental aspect of canine behavior that as the years go by, it's shedding more and more light on how our furry friends, they can adapt and thrive in their environments because that's what dogs do. Dogs have been domesticated over many, many years and then they adjust and they grow. So on social learning and on socialization, historically what they used to do was you would actually be given a checklist and it would say you've got to expose your puppy to a hundred people, a man in a high-vis vest, a woman in a fruit hat, somebody with an afro, somebody with long hair, somebody with a mohawk, and you had all these crazy things on the list. But with advancements in uh, canine cognition and understanding what we do now, what we really understand is that it's about quality over quantity. So we don't necessarily want to just expose our dogs to as much as possible because because what could end up happening when that we do that is that we will flood them. So when they're flooded, they become overwhelmed. And that means that they're not actually learning appropriately or positively to that environment or to those people or other animals. So it's similar to when we have kids. If I go to a playground and I've got my daughter with me, If I see a group of kids that are not being very nice, let's say, I'm not going to allow my daughter to go and play with them because I know that their behavior, not only is that going to potentially 
put my daughter into an uncomfortable situation, but she could learn from their behavior and start imitating that. And her dogs, <clears throat> and her dogs do the exact same thing. So if you go to a dog park and just allow your dog to go and play with all of the dogs without having first looked at the dogs and looked at how they're playing and even to a certain extent, take a look at the owners and scope out what you think their mindset is because that will have a big impact on how their dog behaves as well. Basically, what I'm saying here is when it comes to social learning, it's not just about exposure. It's about the quality of that exposure. And managing how we do that is very important. It's not just about when our dogs are in puppyhood. It's beyond that. You can socialize a 10-year-old dog if they're under-socialized. Yep, it's going to take a little bit more work. Yeah, you've got to be more patient, but it can be done. And the other aspect about social learning that I want to tap on is dogs don't just learn from other dogs. As Jay said, if you've got a dog that grows up around cats or a cat that grows up around dogs, their behavior will imitate that of the other animal. Well, they do the exact same thing with humans. So if you have a dog and your household is a very aggressive household, there's a lot of shouting, a lot of screaming, maybe even some physical altercations within the house. The average Asian household, yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're effectively teaching your dog that that is an appropriate way to behave. At the same time, if you are calm and confident and in control and you you talk about things, you don't lose your temper, you don't go out of control, you are effectively teaching your dog that being calm should be the default. So social learning is not just on other dogs and other animals or even other people. It's on yourself. Your dog learns from your behavior as well, which actually leads us quite nicely on to learned behavior. So when we talk about learned behavior, this is fairly self-explanatory. Your experiences shape the way that you behave. I think that's something that everybody would agree with. If you have a bad experience with a Scottish person, the next time you meet a Scottish person, you might be a little bit apprehensive when you're around them. If you have a good experience with a Singaporean person, the next time you meet a Singaporean person, you're going to be a lot more warm and a lot more receiving in what's going on. So the same thing happens with dogs. If they have a bad experience with a man, but a good experience with a woman, the dog could potentially become more reactive towards men and more loving towards ladies. Now, you see that quite a lot in the rescue community, quite simply because a lot of these dogs are rescued from construction sites and industrial areas where the workers are generally men, and they're just working around them. So they'll be like throwing trash into the bin, which the dogs might be beside, or they might be driving forklifts or lifting and dumping down heavy items, metal items, which would spook and scare the dogs. So the dogs have got a negative association to them. Then the dog is not being racist. <laughs> <laughs> then when the dog is rescued, they then go into foster care, which in Singapore at the very least, and to be honest, in most of the world, the volunteers are more often than not ladies. So that does have a big impact and it's a good example of learned behaviour and how the po like past traumatic experiences or even abuse, which you see a lot in dogs that have been abandoned after having been in a neglectful or abusive household. So learned behaviour is incredibly important to understand when it comes to dog aggression. The next one is their genetic predisposition, which is also the breed that they are. So certain dogs have been bred to be more alert. Certain dogs have been bred to be more of a lap dog. It depends on what dog you're getting. Um, dogs like your German Shepherds, your Dobermans, your Rottweilers, guard dogs in general, or working line dogs, they, they, have, they are more predispositioned to... Reactivity. To reactivity, yeah. 
to reactivity. And it is your job to do a research on the breed before you get it. I mean, of course, if you're in a situation whereby you're adopting the dog or you're giving foster care to the dog, it's a little bit different. But researching on the breed helps you understand and prepare better for what's going to come in the next few months or years. So breed types like Singapore Specials, they're mixed breed. It's not really a breed. Yeah, so they're just... For, for our international listeners, when we refer to Singapore Specials, we are talking about the street dogs, the jungle dogs, the stray dogs. So they're complete mongrels and they're a real interesting mix. And actually, there's some real interesting genetics that happen because of the fact that we are on an island here in Singapore and um, the dogs don't have as broad a genetic pool to draw from. And also because there's a massive reduction in wild spaces where they can be free. So all of that actually shapes their genetic predisposition, even within a matter of five, 10, 20 generations. So it's very, very clear that the genetics have an impact on the behavior of the dog and thus has an impact on the potential for them to have reactivity. So when we talk about breeds, it's interesting because you'll hear a lot of people saying, a dog's a dog, the breed doesn't matter. That's a very dangerous mindset to have because let's, for argument's sake, say that all dogs are behaviorally the same. They're still not created equal. A mastiff has got a much greater capacity to cause damage than a pom. So a Pomeranian cannot cause the same amount of damage as a mastiff. Of course, they can still cause damage. I'm not arguing that point. But you cannot say that if a dog is physically different, that they're not genetically different because their genetics have a direct impact on their physical being. So even just when I take myself and Jay, we are both homo sapiens. But Jay's Chinese and I'm European. So genetically, we have differences because of how our ancestors evolved in the areas that they were. So there's different things that have changed, such as the most obvious one is skin color, so that our bodies would get the appropriate amount of vitamin D due to the sunlight in the areas that we evolved. But you also get behavioral changes as well. And dogs are no different, except even more so. Because we're not just talking about natural selection, we are talking about selective breeding, where people have genuinely, over thousands of years, have said, okay, this dog is protecting the camp more than the other dog, and this dog also protects the camp. Let's put them together and create puppies which have a similar disposition. And more that's likely to protect the camp. Exactly. And then you'll do the same with, oh, this dog's rather cute and gentle. So is this dog, put them together, get another cute, friendly dog as puppies. So that's what's happened with selective breeding. So with that, <clears throat> with that, we cannot pretend that genetics don't have an impact. And as Jay said, it's our responsibility as dog guardians to ensure that we know what we are getting into. If you're adopting a street dog, for example, you've got to understand that they may be more skittish than most other pedigrees because that's a genetic requirement to survive on the streets or in the jungle or in the industrial zones or construction sites. If they're not aware of what's going on around them, they could get hurt and die and therefore do not pass on that genetic code. And that's how natural selection works. The if dogs are, that, sorry. Go on. So the street dogs or the jungle dogs that, that we see more commonly nowadays are known to have a lot of bite histories as well. And that's because, like Frazier said, they, when we talk about the freeze flight or fight response, being, doing a freeze response in the jungle doesn't help anyone. And the dogs that actually 
only rely on freeze responses usually <laughs> won't survive. It's natural selection. So they best have to fight scenario, back. <laughs> best case scenario, the dogs that freeze will be captured and rehomed. But yeah, even so, they're still being taken out of that genetic pool. Yeah, because they get uh, neutered or sterilized already. Exactly. So the same goes for breed. If you know what your breed was originally designed for, and I say designed because that's what selective breeding is, you've got to understand what was the job, what was the purpose of that breed originally, and understand that your dog will more than likely still have some predispositions to that personality type. Of course, every dog is an individual, every dog is different. Just because you've got a guarding breed doesn't necessarily mean that your dog's going to be a good guard dog. A proper guard dog takes months, if not years, of specialised training to achieve. You can't just get a dog and expect them to be a guard dog. At the same time, you might get a dog thinking that you're going to get a nice, gentle dog, and it turns out that they're not. There's always exceptions to the rule. So as much as we're talking about genetic predisposition with regards to breed, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get what it says on the tin, as it were. So you've got to be aware of that as well. There's still personalities to consider as well. Exactly. Because every dog has their own personality, and most of it is it comes from their upbringing and what we said earlier, social learning, learned behavior and all that. Like you can't get a chihuahua or a basset hound and then complain that they're barking. Yeah. But these dogs were selectively chosen to be noisy, to bark a lot. Yeah. I mean, actually, here's another, here's a wee example. Our dog, when I was a teenager, Brioch, was a beautiful big black Labrador. Came from genuine high-level gun dog stock. But he was terrified of gunshots. So they <laughs> couldn't sell him as a gun dog, which is why we ended up adopting him. Now, of course, if I knew then what I know now, it would have been a very different situation. But at the time, obviously, I didn't. And he was bred to be a gun dog, but because of his fear because of his anxiety levels with regards to gunshots and fireworks and thunder, he wasn't able to do that purpose. So just because he's been genetically bred for that doesn't mean he's going to be necessarily able to do it. So that leads us on to the next point, medical issues or pain. So this one should be very, very obvious. But it's amazing how often people don't consider it. So if you had a migraine, if you had a sore head, your patient's level is going to be dramatically reduced. So if your dog is feeling discomfort or pain, why would you think that would be any different? So we need to be aware of that when we look at a dog and say, okay, my dog doesn't normally react like this. What's going on? You don't just blame the dog. You say, well, are they in discomfort or pain? Are they maybe developing arthritis if they're getting older? Have they injured themselves? Are they going through an allergy flare-up? Did they step on an ant's nest? Yeah, oh, that one sucks. Yeah. I always pick up ants from Blue's feet because she likes to run around in, in the grassy fields. Yep. So, I mean, all of this is part of it. So it's a very important aspect to understand that if your dog has any medical conditions, you are effectively needing to understand that their fuse, their patience level is going to be shortened. Now, if you've got a dog that's got a massive patience level anyway, that's not so important. So, for example, Aramis, my dog <laughs> is super chilled. Like, it's like very rarely will you see him ever get upset. React, yeah. But he also has allergies and arthritis in his hips. So that's taking up a big chunk of his patience level, but because he's got so much of it, it's not a problem. Where if you had a hyperactive dog who was feeling discomfort and pain, that would be a much more potential for reactivity in that setting. So we need to be aware of 
any medical issues, physical pain, itchiness, allergies, disease, all of those things, they need to be taken into account as a potential cause of dog aggression. So the next one that I want to touch on is frustration or reinforcement of aggressive behavior. Um, I'll leave the reinforcement one to you, Frazier. But basically, frustration is a powerful trigger for aggression in dogs. I mean, it, it applies to us as well, right? When we're frustrated, we have, we have more reactivity to things. Like you could have a really shit day and then you just get very frustrated. By the end of the day, one small thing could set you off. For dogs, it's more of when a dog is unable to fulfill its desired goal or expectation, such as they are, they are more reactive to other dogs and they're on a leash. So they are trying to reach the other dog, whether it be it um, excitement or aggression, or obtain a toy. Uh, Porthos is really one with this. If you throw the ball, it gets stuck on the a sofa or something and he can't reach it, he starts to yelp or whine or bark. So yeah. Uh, that 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 comes from frustration as well, but unmanaged frustration gets pent up and it can escalate into aggressive behavior. This frustration aggression link is often when a dog's attempt at communication or interaction is unsuccessful or goes ignored, you know. But it puts your dog in a very heightened emotional state, which may lead to reactive behaviors like your barking, lunging, or snapping, even biting. As the dog's frustration finds an outlet in aggressive responses, it becomes more crucial for us as dog owners to recognize all the signs of frustrations for your dogs. Because like I said earlier, every dog can show different signs of how they want to convey their current current thinking or th thought process and you have to address it of course through you know your appropriate training your socialization and management techniques to prevent this development of aggressive behavior so when we speak about the reinforcement of aggressive behavior a lot of people get confused with regards to this there's two ways that aggressive behavior gets reinforced and the first one is people attempting to correct their dog using aversive techniques. This is a hot topic. A lot of people like to argue about it. I am yet to have a proper discussion with somebody who doesn't see the light at the end of the tunnel after a proper discussion. So it's fairly simple when it, with regard to this one. As we said earlier on, most aggressive behaviour is born out of fear. So if you are using fear, discomfort, or pain in an attempt to correct your dog or to teach them a lesson, all you're doing is adding onto that already stressful, fearful, frustrated situation. So a good example of this is when you have a dog on the lead and you're concerned as the dog walker that your dog is going to react to an old man walking past. So you start to get very tense on the lead. So you're holding the lead real tense. And then when your dog looks at the old man, you jar the leash and it jars the dog's neck. Maybe you're using a choke chain or a prong collar or God knows, one of, the, one of these other aversive tools that, frankly especially in this case, will most certainly reinforce aggressive behavior rather than stop it. Because you're adding a negative stimulus to a situation where they were already seeing a negative. So as a result, now your dog is thinking, old man, pain in the neck. So every time he sees the old man or any old man, he's going to be more likely to react because you have reinforced that aggressive behavior. Now, I know I can almost hear some of the listeners trying to argue this point away, but I'd like you to put yourself in the dog's shoes here. If we were sitting in a bar and you turned to me and you said, Fraser, I don't like that person over there. If every single time you looked at that person, I flicked your ear really hard, 
Are you A, going to calm down and be less annoyed at that person? Or B, become more aggravated and more annoyed with that person? And there's a C option, are you going to turn on me and show redirected aggression? So with those three there, I think it's safe to say that anybody with a brain is going to agree that adding pain and discomfort to an already uncomfortable situation is not the way forward. And in fact, actually would reinforce that aggressive behavior. So this leads us very nicely on to the buildup of anxiety and stress. So the metaphor I like to use with this is that of a bucket. So imagine that you have a bucket and that bucket is where you hold all of your stress. And the stress might be represented by water. If you wake up in the morning and you go to have a shower, but there's no hot water, you could put in a cup of stress. So now you've got some stress in your bucket. Now in this bucket, there's a hole, but some people have tiny little holes, so it's just drip, drip, drip. Other people have got bigger holes where the bucket can empty out fairly quickly. But you've poured in that cup of stress. Then maybe you go onto social media and you see some horrible news. So let's put in a couple of cups of stress there. So now the level in your bucket's going up. You go to work. You're just told that you're being disciplined because you made a mistake the week prior. Put in another couple of uh, cups into that bucket. Now your bucket's halfway full. You're not able to empty that bucket out as quickly as it's being filled. Then you might hear some amazing news, some super exciting news. Well, you'd think that'd be a good thing, but adrenaline is adrenaline, and that goes into the stress bucket as well. So now you've got another two cups that are going into your bucket. So now your bucket is fairly full and you're almost at the level where you start to feel anxious and overwhelmed. So then it could be something simple. Somebody walks past your desk in the office and says, hey, are you going to be ready for that meeting? It starts in half an hour and you snap at them. Say, what's it to you? Whoa, hold on a second. What did, that, what did I do wrong? I just asked you a question. It's not necessarily that small trigger, which might only be half a cup of stress. But because of everything that's happened beforehand, that has compounded, that has built up. So that one smaller trigger, trigger, that one smaller trigger pushes you over the edge and you react to that. Our dogs are the exact same. So things are overexciting, things that are stressful, things that are scary. All of these things fill our dog's bucket. Some dogs have got those big holes and they just chill out very quickly afterwards and that's great. Some of them have got big whiskey barrels as their bucket. Some of them have got tiny little thimbles, the same as us. So understanding what kind of capacity for stress your dog has is quite important. And you, know, and you figure that out through observation. So it's important to remember that the time it takes for your dog's stress level to go from overwhelm back down to a basal level or normal level of stress is 72 hours. And that number has been taken from a study that was done in London in 2013 after Guy Fox night, where they took blood samples of dogs periodically to find out what level of stress hormone was in there. Now, that's an average. Obviously, if you've got a more anxious dog, that might be longer. If you've got a calmer dog, it's going to be substantially less. But when we're looking at the stress, we've got to understand that the severity of the overwhelm is going to have an impact. The previous experiences, we were talking about learned behavior, that will have an impact on how much each individual situation impacts them. Your response to a situation is going to have a big impact to that as well. The other thing is, is that your time and patience after the fact is going to have a big impact. If you get frustrated at your dog for being stressed, they're going to be stressed for longer. So just while we're on this, 
how you would actually help reduce your dog's stress after the fact would be providing a safe space, which we're going to talk about at length in the next episode on this. Limiting their exposure to the stressful stimulus. If your dog is scared of fireworks, do your utmost to reduce the impact on fireworks to them. Do you have noise proofing? Do, do you take them out before fireworks, making sure that you're not taking them out after dark when they're more likely to be going off? Limit the exposure. Same thing if your dog is dog reactive, limit the exposure. Take them out for walks when it's less busy, when you're not as likely to run into another dog. You want to engage them in calming activities, like what I like to call sniffaries, where you just let your dog have a good smell around when they're walking so that they're able to totally decompress. There's other things you can do, like interactive play, snuffle mats and things like that. I actually spoke about that at a little bit of length on the live session last week, if anybody's more interested in wanting to find out more. Avoiding pressure. So don't pressure your dog into those new experiences that are potentially going to be stressing them out because that is going to be a big impact on how stressed out they actually become. So always be aware about how you can mitigate that stress level in your dog with regards to the stress bucket. So the next and last point for all of these causes of dog aggression is hormonal changes. So it's quite crucial to understand that hormonal changes is a very important role in shaping a dog's behavior and physiological responses throughout their different life stages, right? Just similar to us humans, hormonal fluctuations can influence a dog's mood, their energy levels, and even their interactions, like puberty, for instance. They can bring about behavioral changes as they have more hormones surging through them and potentially leading to increased territorial behavior or social dynamics. Hormonal shifts in female dogs is from what, what I've learned was during estrus, they can impact their demeanor and interaction with other dogs. Whether you want to spay or neuter your dog also influences behavior by altering their hormone levels. There have been studies that said that spaying or neutering can potentially reduce uh, aggressive tendencies or certain mating-related behaviors, but I like to believe that it's just purely for the mating-related behaviors. A well-socialized dog would know how to handle itself in an uh, aggressive or fearful situation. Recognizing and understanding these hormonal influences is also very essential for us because they can guide your decision on whether spaying or neutering impacts managing behavioral changes. So, of course, please work with your vets and your professionals so that you can navigate all these complexities of hormonal changes for your pets. So when we're talking about hormonal changes with regards to adolescents and neutering and things like that, there's a lot of information out there. So just looking at adolescents for the first part here, it's not dissimilar to what it's like for us going through adolescence. We don't really know ourselves properly yet. We're, we're a bit socially awkward. We're maybe a little bit overexcitable. Sometimes we might go through some off days Dogs are the exact same, and we've got to understand that and respect that so that we're not putting them into, unfortunately, so that we're not putting them into stressful situations which are not required. We've also got to understand that when they get into adolescence, they will be starting to push the boundaries a little bit, not just with us, but with other dogs as well. So that's all coming from a place of hormonal changes. When you neuter a dog you're effectively shutting down a large part of their hormone development. So that's why I'm really against dogs being neutered too young, especially male dogs, because if you're cutting off the testosterone production when that dog is still very much a puppy, you're effectively not letting them have the full development of their hormones to become an adult. So they'll effectively become more puppy-like for the rest of their life. And therefore, they're going to be more skittish. 
you're not letting them build up that level of testosterone, which is required to increase their confidence. Now, with that said, there's also been studies, as Jay said, that suggest that when you do neuter a dog, whether it be male or female, that they can become less prone to reactivity and aggression. However, on the flip side, there has also been studies which suggest the exact opposite. So it's one of these cases where people can pick and choose a study to fit the narrative that they're looking for. But from experience, one thing I would say is fairly common is male dogs becoming neutered and then developing reactivity towards male dogs that have not been neutered. That's fairly common. So you want to be aware of that. And when your dog gets neutered, do everything that you can to re-socialize them into those environments so that you're continuing that positive reinforcement with them. So I'm very aware, guys, that we've gone on at quite a length about the causes and different types of dog aggression. We'll end this today so that we're not having a four-hour podcast. But it does mean that we'll probably need to split this into more, which is fine. And next time we'll be talking about the management of dog aggression and how we actually can ensure that we are keeping ourselves and our dogs safe with our dogs experiencing this reactivity or aggression. So with regards to dog aggression, please remember that when you're addressing it, it requires understanding, patience, and more often than not, you will need professional guidance. Dog aggression is not an easy thing to sort out. But it is very doable. It can be done. The one thing that I will say before we wrap up this episode is this. I've said it earlier on, but I'm going to say it again. You cannot solve a situation which is root cause is based in fear by using fear, discomfort, or pain. It's just that simple. So with the right approach... You can help your dog become a well-adjusted and happy dog. And with that said, guys, thank you for tuning into this episode of Wagging Tails. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and we'll keep an eye on Facebook and Instagram for more discussion on important topics about our dogs.